introduce today's speaker, my good friend Dick Gibson. Dick is not from Butte, and he's not a historian by vocation. Dick is a geologist um, and um, now works as a consulting geologist still for various places, but at a point in time about 10 years ago, Dick decided to come to Montana, and he was familiar with Montana because Indiana University, his um, alma mater, had a research station in this area. And so Dick came to Butte and immediately jumped into, along with his um, consulting geology business, jumped into volunteering for projects that were close to his heart, starting with the World Museum of Mining, and then he joined Butte Citizens for Preservation, of which I was a member, so that was the point in time which I met him. And his, his um, Dick has an amazing ability and a great curiosity about everything, which led him to delve into Butte's history till he knows more about it than pretty much any Butte native I know, <laughs> except maybe for Ellen Crane, our director. <laughs> and, he is also... Lee Whitney might take issue with that statement. Too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, but Dick not only delves into this stuff, but then he turns around and he shares it. And he became a tour guide with the Historical Adventures walking tour. And then he got his CDL license and he became a trolley driver for the Butte um, trolley tours. And he has helped us um, with many walking tours of various aspects of history through Citizens for Preservation. And he can write. And he has written small books, um, bigger books. His, one of his newest ones that we proudly have on sale here is his Lost Books. He also writes books on geology that are um, what, things, where things, what things are made of. And so it takes you into the geology of all the minerals you can imagine and tells you what things we use every day that are made out of them and where those minerals are being mined all over the world in a way that a non-scientist can say, this is really interesting. <coughs> oh, I'm going to take longer introducing Dick <laughs> than... In the talk. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Anyway, he's fabulous, and we're so happy that he gives his time generously to us to do things like our brown bag lunch. And um, also, he has a blog, and if you want to get on it, it's Butte... Butte History at blogspot.com. Butte History at blogspot.com. And so as he runs into really interesting things, he comes here and researches the daylights out of the truth behind him and posts them on his blog. Dick. Thank you, Irene, for that very nice introduction. She probably could have been less gentle if she'd tried. Um, I just have to say that I don't do this because I'm generous. I do this because it's fun. That's why I do stuff. And at this stage in my life, I'm able to do things that I feel like doing, that I like doing. And I'm overjoyed to be able to do things that are fun. So investigating new history, places where I personally walk every day, or even days like today, that's what got me doing it. It was like, oh my god, really? Really? You can hardly believe some of the things that truly happen in view. And when we do the walking tours, when I'm standing in front of the jail, the first thing I say is, I'm swearing to you right now, I won't make up anything because Butte does not need any embellishment. <laughs> the true stories are unbelievable enough. So I totally believe in true stories, and uh, yeah, you can spin them in an entertaining way, and hopefully we do that too. So uh, we'll start with this talk. and. The first thing that I have to do is give you my disclaimer. Um, nobody knows everything, and I absolutely know that I do not. There are things that I know more about than others, and this one is lower on the list. Uh, so I'm just advertising right out, flat out, I absolutely do not remotely know everything that there is to know about the underground, whatever it is we're going to talk about here in view. So uh, I have every expectation that some of you will have direct experience underground in the sidewalk, in a tunnel, in a whatever, a basement that's got a weird passage or something like that. I absolutely expect that. So, uh, uh, so that may go against some of the things that I say or even that I conclude. 
Well, if I come to a conclusion here today, that doesn't mean I even believe I'm completely right. <laughs> so uh, uh, this, is, this is history in flux, because it's not something you can come here to the archives and find the answer about when that building was built, when this was built. These things are hidden. And there may well be something right here in this archives that, uh, that tells you more than I have researched so far. Partly that's because Lee Whitney hit me up to do this like two weeks ago. And so <laughs> this, this has been put together based on some background that I already had and a, and a small amount of, of more recent research. So that's the disclaimer to keep the, the Tommy knockers here from, uh, from getting me in trouble sometime if I do go underground wherever I may happen to go. Okay, types of tunnels. Here are the kinds that I've come up with as a list. Mine tunnels, steam tunnels, stormwater tunnels, Utility conduits and subsite walk walls. The main ones that I'll talk most about are going to be some steam tunnel stories, a little bit of stormwater water stories, and especially the under the sidewalk spaces, which are the easiest ones to, to talk about because we've seen some of those, especially quite recently, and we'll talk a little bit about that. The mine tunnels, you probably know about 10,000 miles of underground tunnels here in Butte. There is uh, not really any doubt about that. When this map was made by the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology, they did it in a GIS sense. So it's not an exaggeration to say that Butte has about 10,000 miles of tunnels underground. Well, we're not going to talk about those. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the setting for what we are going to talk about. The 1906-1907 building boom. This was pretty much the end of the War of the Copper Kings. Yes, William Clark continued owning things for some time until he died and the, his uh, uh, estate was settled in uh, 1928. But basically, this was when Heinz was out of the picture and money was freed up. It wasn't that we're talking about title to the property, but money was available for investment and building buildings and so on. So it was a phenomenal time when some of the biggest buildings in the uptown today, the Metals, the Phoenix, Carpenters Union, Silver Boat Club, all these hotels, the Thornton, the Napton, the Leonard, these were all humongous. They are all humongous buildings. All of them built in 1906 and a few into 1907. Uh, Baptist Church was finished in 1907, for example. But that was one of the really major building booms. So this is happening. Well, all of these buildings, they need things like heat and light and electricity and things like that. Electricity had come to Butte early on. We had our first uh, plant generating electricity for other than mines in 1884. But it wasn't really until about the middle 1890s that things really started to grow. And then, 1906, things are really popping. So this is a time of building. I just can't imagine what Granite Street was like in 1906 with those gigantic buildings going up all almost simultaneously. Even Park Street with both the Phoenix and the Meadows and probably a handful of other things too. Just an amazing time. So the building boom is, is really the, the, the basis for the, the places that we're going to talk about. Some of them go back beyond 1906, but, uh, but this is really what got it chugging along. Oh, and just let me point out, they were so proud of it. Have you seen the, the marquee of the, of the Napton? This is one of four big medallions up there. The others say one, nine, and zero. <laughs> They're proud of 1906 is what they are. So the next time you're in front of the Napton, check it out. Four medallions, all different from each other, celebrating that year, 1906. Okay, the steam tunnels we'll talk about first. Now, I realize this photo's out of the newspaper. It's a little bit uh, um, hard to see, but the caption tells us where it is. It's on East Park Street, and lo and behold, we can actually read the addresses. There's a 24 and there's a 30. So given that now, we know where this is. Can you visualize where that is? It's basically the drive-through of the U.S. Bank is, is where this location is. And uh, the uh, story here in the Butte Minor of 1906 they have written it better than I could possibly ever write. So let me just read you a little bit of what they were writing about. Under Butte's Business Center in 1906, the great copper metropolis is being honeycombed with conduits, two miles of catacomb-like tunnels 20 feet below the surface of the principal commercial districts. The uh, um, uh, Butte Miner uh, reporter got a tour underground, and he says, uh, now it is possible to walk through two miles of passages, 20, below, 20 feet below the surface, each long gallery big enough to permit a man six feet tall to walk along through it without stooping. A trip through the passages is like an expedition through the catacombs of ancient Rome, though, of course, no ossified remains of martyrs are on exhibition in the <laughs> labyrinth. 
Well, maybe they're on today. Who knows? <laughs> now he's talking about these shafts that are that are, are were excavated to uh, to uh, create the tunnels. They did it just like a little mine. That's what it amounts to. <coughs> the main shaft on Broadway is located close to the sidewalk and the alley at the rear of the building occupied by Height and Fairfield. That would be um, approximately uh, where the uh, Montana Power Company is today. The main shaft on Park Street, that's one right here, on the uh, site opposite the Owsley Building, and its hoist is operated by means of a long cable that reached high over Park Street, over a big two-story building, and to the engine room of the company's present plant back of the City Hall Building. That would be right behind what today is Trimbo's Pizza. That was the Owsley block that they're talking about, the corner building. Uh, where the Medical Arts Center, most of you know it as, burned down in 1973, that was actually Owsley Block Number 3. So Owsley Block Number 1, which they're talking about here, is the building that is Trimbo's today. Um, and at the drift space, the tunnels are pushed along just as are the drifts in the mines. The manner in which the concrete lining is put in place is interesting. A steel hoop supported over supporting an oval mold is put in place. The concrete is then forced in between the mold and the tunnel's sides and top. After 48 hours, the mold is removed and the concrete lining is firmly in place. The purpose of the company is to supply with steam heat every building in Butte, the system doing away with boiler rooms and the danger of fire. That was the purpose. Now, they didn't get all that far. They didn't get to every building in Butte. And the larger ones, places like the courthouse and so on, had their own system, and that continued. And I have not exactly figured out when. This is the Phoenix, by the way. The Phoenix Electrical and Heating Company uh, was the name of the company. But uh, they did continue for some time. And here is where that shaft was. Uh, here's East Park Street and Main. So this is the building that would become the Rialto Theater. This is from 1914. The Rialto went up in 1916. The Park Theater is going to be right there. And right there is where that shaft is. So this is U.S. Bank today. This is their drive-through and a vacant lot and part of the drive-through. And then these buildings here on East Park are still there, the Ivanhoe and the Imperial. And then the Greek Cafe building, which is not here but would be there in 1917, is of course gone today too. So this is the sandboard map of that section where the, uh, uh, the mine shaft was. And the Board of Trade, of course, that probably some of you remember, the first Board of Trade. The second one after this one was destroyed in 1965, moved up to the corner of Broadway and Main Street, and it burned down in 1969. <laughs> Sorry, Board of Trade. <laughs> okay, so this, this map is based on this map, which I got out of the archives here. It's in their vertical file. And um, you can't see anything here, so I've sort of made a summary of it up there. And these are all of sort of different sizes and, and, and so on underground. But the two big um, uh, features are the plants. The first one is that one right there. That's right behind where Trimbo's Pizza is today. And this one was in the basement of one of the Northwestern Energy buildings today. And as far as I know, most of those boilers are still down there because they were so huge, you didn't really move them. You just turned them off when you were done. So this is 1914. The red lines show the, the mains. These are the main steam tunnels. And branching off from them would be little conduits that went into each individual building. So, for example, the uh, M&M, which is right about here, they were served by that boiler. The City Hall, which is up here, was served by that boiler. They went all the way up to the Hennessy building here, which was served by that boiler. They go all the way over here to the back side of the Carpenters Union Hall, which was served by that boiler. So that's as far as it went in 1914. Here is the map showing those boilers. Again, here's the alleyway beside the city hall and the, fire, and the uh, uh, police station. The big Owsley block, the parking lot today, would be right here. So this is Trimbo's here, and these are the Northwestern Energy Building. See black things like this on the sandbar maps, that's what how boilers are shown. So that's where they were. Now by a little bit later, and unfortunately on the, on the copy that the archives has, it says March, comma, and that's the end of it. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know what year it is. It's clearly later than that 1914 map, but not much later. They have made these many additions, these, these green lines. They've gone as far west as Idaho Street. They have not gone any further north because they're already serving everything on the south side of Granite Street. And like I said, I'm pretty sure that the courthouse and the things that were up here were served by the big boilers that were under, 
I'm not quite sure positive where they were, um, under either the uh, <coughs> of the Sheriff's Department now, or possibly underneath what amounts to the yard out there today. Okay, let's move on to stormwater culverts. There was a river that came down right about here. Uh, here's where we are today, it's about right there. So this is Alaska Street, right down here. And this is Buffalo Gulch. Buffalo Gulch came down from the east side of the original mine up there, up there, and um, uh, came down and went right through the heart of town. Well, by 1884, which is the date of this uh, bird's eye map that you see here, which is remarkably accurate, I have to tell you, when you compare these to the Sanborn maps, the details are just unbelievable, that the, that the two different approaches to the way the uptown looked are almost literally beyond belief. But in any case, this was still a gulch here, but then where's it going to go? Well, it's going to go underneath the city in 1884 and comes out under a culvert at Galena Street. And now you can see the topography here quite well as it continues on down to the south and ultimately down to Silver Bow Creek. Well, what's going on up here? It's all been covered over by 1884. In 1884, Butte probably had no more than four to 6,000 people, but they were already modifying the landscape, not just where the mines were, but where the city was, too. So that gulch, Buffalo Gulch, that's underneath here, is gone by 1884, at least on the surface. Now here's the map of it. Here are the, now it looks like a stream because I colored it blue, right? <laughs> so uh, here's the courthouse. Here's where the archives is today, where we are right now. The original mine is up here above the, the courthouse. Actually, it's over here now. So, but this country up here, this is all going to change when the original mine really gets going and really wipes out the landscape. But here it does. It comes down here, goes under this building here, and from here on down, it's underground. Here it is closed up a little bit. This is the skating rink that was um, just around the corner here on Alaska Street, uh, across from the Silver Boat Club. Up here, the label says, large amount of water in spring and winter. <laughs> and right here, you can't read it, but it says, stone culvert taking water under building. So the building sits on top of the stream, covers it up, and then when it comes out of there, this is labeled culvert and then underground ditch. Now, I'm not sure where Robert Edwards took this picture, but this is in the approximately 1884-age culvert that was uh, uh, used to constrain that flow into the underground. I think this is down probably on Broadway or, or Park Street somewhere. He got in there with somebody for some reason and got that great picture of it. So these are big things, like that description was reading. You know, they're, they're many uh, feet tall, enough for people to walk through, no question about that. We'll go a little further down, now from Broadway, down to Park, and down to Galena, where it's labeled underground ditch and sewer. Now, and this is a photo from 2011 when they were redoing all that stuff. Do you remember that, that time? Right out here in the parking lot by the corner across from the bail bonds building, that street was under construction. So was uh, Broadway across from the um, uh, IOGT place where Broadway Antiques is today. So was Park Street right in front of the Phoenix building. They were absolutely following this culvert which follows that stream. So there really isn't any doubt about that. That's, that's what was going on. They were redoing some of these things that had fallen down after a hundred and, I can't do that much math, 130 years almost. <laughs> so, uh, so the stuff is still down there, but the tunnel is there, and it takes the stormwater runoff through that culvert that used to be a surface river, a gulch, at least in spring and winter. <laughs> Okay, coming out further south, Park to Glenna. This is now up to 1888, and here's the 1884 picture again. So here's where it came out under Galena Street, and then goes chugging along here between Colorado and Dakota. By 1888, just four years later, they have really seriously constrained it quite a bit. And now the stream is over here under Colorado Street, probably with God knows what crossing it here on Mercury, because this part of Mercury in Colorado, what it says right here is not improved, not improved. Well, they really mean it. In 1888, <laughs> not improved means that it was rutted and dirt and whatever. There was no gravel, there was no nothing. So this part of town in 1888 was where Chinatown was expanding, and below Mercury Street, there really wasn't very much at all in 1888. 
So they're constraining this thing over that way, over into where the street is, away from where it was, because this is starting to build up. You can see the buildings that are happening here. So just in that four year period, things are changing fairly dramatically. Okay, so much for that. Here's utility conduits. These photos, I'm sorry they're so poor, but it's not my fault. Talk to the Butte Minor photographer in 1906. <laughs> um, uh, they're, they're also reporting, in addition to those big tunnels, on the telephone conduits and so on that are being put underground. Now, 1906 is right when the uh, Rocky Mountain Bell Telephone Company was beginning to have its first competition, the Intermountain Telephone Company, which the um, uh, the water company building was built in 1906 as the headquarters for the Intermountain Telephone Company. It became the water company, I think, about 1916 or so. It still is, of course. So uh, uh, competition was happening. There were two different sets of telephone lines being laid. When you look at the phone directories or the city directories in this time frame, or the ads, especially in the papers, you see that um, um, good businesses, prosperous businesses, will report that they had both telephone companies, and they'll give you two different phone numbers, because they run completely different systems. Well, where are they going to put them? Of course, telephone lines are above ground, but here in the uptown, a lot of the telephone lines, even as early as 1906, went underground. And I realize very well that you can't see these very much, but these are simple little trenches. These are trenches into which they're going to bury a pipe that has the wire. <coughs> That's what it amounts to. So these are not in the category of tunnels that you could walk through, or I don't think even crawl through, to get anywhere. The, the stormwater tunnels, that's another story, um, and uh, the, the steam tunnels as well. You probably could have crawled through the narrow tunnel that took the steam into each individual building, and then when you get back to that main line, yeah, that's where you have walking tunnel uh, underneath the streets. So these are not uh, all that interesting, and come up to 19, or last year, 2012, this is the corner of Main Street and uh, 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 Granite Street out here, there's the Tennessee building and the Sears building there when they opened it up to redo or put in more of these things. And again, they're, they're, they're filled in. These are just pipes that are buried down there. A lot of interesting, cool stuff, though. You know what these things are right here? Cables. I heard somebody say trap, I think, right? Yeah, those are the, those are the trolley car traps. And I don't know how, how much it is, but you know, when they tear up the streets uptown, you often see those trolley car tracks still down there. Um, and the last time they were used was 1937. So, uh, so they're still down there. And here, someone said cobblestones. There's the cobblestone layer underneath Main Street right there. That's a, a good prominent one there. And all kinds of other stuff. Underneath that, there's wood. Now, I'm not willing to say flat out that that was the original wooden street because, I mean, I was behind the fence. I, worked, I wasn't going down in there. But um, I think there's a medium chance that that's what's under Main Street. We got actually a lot of fill and then down into the granite bedrock and then some wood and then the granite paving stones and then multiple layers of asphalt and concrete. So this cross section here really reveals the history of the way the streets were built as well. But for our purpose today, in terms of tunnels, what I'm saying is there aren't any <laughs> for this kind of purpose. For this purpose, these are, are buried pipes and lines, just as you might expect. You know, the kind of line that brings your plumbing or your electricity or your gas into your house. That's really how it amounts to, because these are not big and, well, I was going to say they don't need much maintenance, but based on the way our streets are shorn up, apparently they do need a lot of maintenance. We'll see what happens next year. So, so I'm done now with utility conduits. We'll, we'll discount that at this point, too. Now let's talk about the sub-sidewalk vaults. This is, these are places where I personally have been a lot and have tried to figure out things so I don't say lies to the tourists and things like that. Um, and you can find out a few things about these from the old maps. For example, here, uh, this is Main Street and, and Granite there. Underneath, that's Curley's, the former Curley's building. It's the second Hennessy building. It says right there, storeroom under walk, and they've even got an outline of it. Under the Hennessy building, it says basement under sidewalk. And that's on both sides of it. So, for sure, we know about that. Well, this is by far the exception. I mean, practically everything in the uptown has a vaulted sidewalk. We'll talk about one exception that I know about, but they're not on the maps. There are places where absolutely, I go and probably a lot of you have gone on the tours, and you see the vaulted sidewalk space. Not on the map, not even suggested on the map. 
So, uh, so the maps are only the starting point. As, as reliable and as wonderful as the Sanborn maps are, they are not the end all. That's not the end of the whole story. So we would have to figure out more beyond that. But some of them, like these ones right here, do specifically indicate what's under the sidewalk. They don't tell you overtly that there's no connection from the end of that vault up that way or the end this way or whatever. But it kind of, I think you would infer that from the way they've drawn it. All right, we'll infer that for a minute, but we'll hold that one in abeyance and see what we can figure out. Okay, how many of you saw the work going on on East Broadway in front of the Uptown Cafe? Okay, most of you did, that's great. Wasn't that spectacular? <laughs> Um, and, and, and what a revelation of, of the, the details that go on down there. Um, this is under the CPA office, Leo Frigge's office here, and this is the one to the west. The main thing that I'm pointing out here is the solid walls. These are walls of that era that separate not only uh, one building from another, but even within a building. The Southern Hotel, which stood there, which he occupies, really evolved from two buildings, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But this is this is within that same building. So that's the uh, east part of his building, this is the west part, and then further along is the Uptown Cafe, further along is Harrington's, further along is the Thornton building. Every one of them has a vaulted sidewalk, and not one of them is interconnected with each other. Not one of them. I mean, look how thick these things are. You know, you're not getting through there, and there is no evidence that this was significantly later than the, than the creation of the vault, and there is no evidence that there was a door that has been filled in or anything like that. It's really quite obvious to me that you couldn't go anywhere uh, along the length of the vault. Basically, what the vaulted sidewalks are, are extensions of the basements. They, they make the basement bigger. That's really the fundamental reason. Now, there's exceptions to that use. But fundamentally, that's what it is. Extending the size of the basement, it's not that mysterious, you've got a bigger room. No big deal. So, another view shows us this, though. This is on the eastern part of the, the Priggies building there. And now it's kind of like, okay, this is really a lot more than you think for the extension of the basement. <laughs> These are cast iron columns here. This is a really nice French door. The, the woodwork is very acceptable for the era, especially having been there for X number of years, probably at least 100, and sitting there unused and, and rotting away. Coming this way a little further, there's a much more uh, utilitarian type of a door. Well, seeing this, it makes you think, that probably was an exterior access storefront under the sidewalk. So, I start going and looking and everywhere I can look, at least look easily, trying to find anything like addresses for 44 and a half, that would be the kind of a number that this would, or 47 and a half, it's on the north side of the street, um, uh, an address that would have been down there. Other places like that, in basements that had outside access, had a one half as the address. So you look for that, you try to find it, you fail. You look on the maps, nothing indicates. Well, we already know that that's not uniform in any case, so we don't really, can't really go by that. All we're going by is the subjective feel that this is so nice looking, why would they have wasted it by having a sidewalk completely blocking it off on top? Looking around too, I don't see any evidence in here that there were ever any stairs that went down into the sidewalk. We can't go by that either, <laughs> because they could have been wooden stairs that were removed. They probably were wooden stairs that were removed. And uh, there isn't anything on the walls of the vault that suggests they had braces or anything like that. So in my mind, we still don't know. And I'm still coming back to this, oh my god, how beautiful the thing is. And why would you waste that in the dark underneath the sidewalk? So to me, I still don't think we know. Um, I have tried to find pictures of this uh, section of Broadway Street uh, where you might be able to see that there was an opening that went down. There aren't that many photos of that stretch of Broadway, and uh, consequently, um, I have not seen one that shows clearly that there was a sidewalk or a stair going down under the sidewalk. So put that in the category of we don't really know for sure. There's no evidence that there were stairs that went down there. But how nice, you know? I mean, that to me is the biggest argument, is the niceness of that storefront. It looks like a storefront, is what it amounts to, and it's under the sidewalk. It's not just where they went out into the rest of the basement and did storage and things like that. At least that's how I would subjectively look at that. 
And another detail is that if you go along the length of it, the width of the vault changes. This is kind of strange too. Here we are under the, the east side, and there is under the west side. And you can see that there's this jog in the wall of the vault. It's about two to three feet uh, narrower as you go into this side over here. Well, why is that? Well, I don't know why, but what I do know is that the building that today, this one right here, is the, the Kriegi's um, um, CPA office, it's not one building. Look at the photo here, maybe a little bit small, but can you see that it's not symmetrical? Look at the way the windows are on the top floor there. Here we got five, a nice symmetrical five arched windows. Over here we got four with a different style in the middle. It's not as wide as this one either. The east half, it's not even half, the east part is narrower than the west part. So this got me all intrigued. Well, what's the story of the building? And maybe that'll help explain something about the vault. And maybe in researching the building, I'll discover something about when the vault was made. Well, no. <laughs> um, this, this building was originally the Southern Hotel. If you go back, and I did not put the whole story of this in the sandboards, but if you go back to the 1884 sandboard maps, the Southern Hotel started as a, a little narrow two-story building that was right there where the east part of this present building is. It was a restaurant and, uh, and rest house is what it was called. And then by 1888, there's a whole conglomeration of little things sort of attached to it and not attached to it. There are things called cabins that are kind of sitting over here, just little one-story things, like the, the outbuildings, or maybe that's where they put the people up. They can't tell from it. They're, they're labeled cabins, so I guess you could sleep in them. Well, that's 1888. The next map that we have is 1890, and then there's 1891 also. And in those maps, all of a sudden, now we have a three-story building over here that's not connected to that one. But that one is a two-story building. Now it's a three-story building today. What, what's going on? Well, unfortunately, we don't have anything between 1891 and 1900. In 1900, we have this. The whole thing is there. It's one building, or kind of one building, um, and uh, attached, apparently, based on the way the map looks. So here's my theory. My theory is that basically what they did about 1892, based on the way things seem, is they put a third floor on the two-story building that was over there, and they connected it to this one and built the whole front facade. This front facade is after 1891 and before 1900. Uh, so if we say about 1892, that'll, that works for today, right? Um, and if you look at the building from the top down, there is a window well, a big light well that's the entire height of the building between those two pieces. It's really quite clear that this was two buildings. Exactly how they evolved, I tried to give you the outline of that, but uh, um, um, it, it kind of doesn't matter. Now it effectively is one building, but I think that helps explain why these vaults are separate in some cases and different widths in other cases. So I did all that work, and no, I didn't figure out anything more about the vault. <laughs> so um, uh, that's just the way it works sometimes. And, and there may be the information, and you know, you do things that you can come up with an answer for a while, but then you get tired and you go on to other things, is what it amounts to. So there's plenty more to, to understand and learn about just this one building that was built uh, as the Southern Hotel about 1892. Okay, here's the Sanborn maps from 1916 and 1900. <coughs> Where we're talking about is right here, the Southern Hotel. And at this point in 1900, they were actually, the Forbes block is the Uptown Cafe. They were using the upper floors of the Uptown Cafe as well in, in 1900. So I don't know how the connections worked, if they went over here and went up those stairs separately. I don't know if there was upstairs connections. I've never been up there. I don't know that story. The main point here is to show you there is nothing at all suggested about a vaulted sidewalk space there. So again, the maps don't help. And in fact, here's the Herber building on the corner. Most of you probably know about the stairs that go down right there into the barber shop. How many of you have taken Obi Historical Adventures tours? Yeah, most of you, some of you. I'll show you some pictures and talk about that. But we know absolutely that there's a vaulted space under both sides of the Herber building here, not on the map, not even suggested on the map. And this was a, a retail establishment under there from 1901 when the building was built until 1969. They had their own address. So, uh, so definitely was there, but not shown on the map. <coughs> a little surprising, you know, especially with an external access retail place. I think you would expect, I would have expected the Sanborn people to have shown something like that. Because the purpose of the Sanborn maps is for fire insurance and for fire departments to know what they're getting into when they go to attack a fire. 
Um, and so the more detail, the better. And the detail is phenomenal, no question. Um, but that's a detail that you kind of think they would have put in and they did not. But also, nothing shown along here. Okay, moving along over now to Galena Street. This uh, photo here it was taken about three years ago by John McKee, the uh, proprietor of Headrain Spirits. He's in the sub-basement, two levels down, under the sidewalk here on Galena Street. That's where that is, is today. And uh, what that building was, the whole building, was the Simons department store, of course. The front building now, the Phoenix, is offices and whatever. The back part was, you can see here, it was a five-story section there. Well, the upper parts were taken off about 1965. So today, it's one story with, I guess they're still parking up on top of that. Um, and under the sidewalk here on Galena Street is the fur vault storage, or was the fur vault storage, and that door is still down here. Another point here that I'm trying to make, and I haven't seen the details down here, but are you going to have this sidewalk being interconnected along the block up here to the movie theater and the garage and whatever, if you got your furs down there? No, I mean, to me, just logical, logic tells you that most of these under the sidewalk vaulted spaces we demonstrate that many of them are private, but logic says that many of them would be private too. If you're talking about the First National Bank over there at Broadway and Main Street, is their basement that probably has vaults and safes and things in it, is it going to connect up the block to the, to the Main Street saloon? I don't think so. <laughs> it's, it's not impossible, but it's just not expectable. Same thing here. You know, the, the likelihood is great that this is just private <laughs> under the sidewalk space, but cool things. Cool things are down there. Now, um, I already asked you how many people have taken the tour. How many of you have taken the Dellinger tour, the tour of this building alone? Okay, not many. Good. Then I'll have some interesting things to tell you. This is where we start our walking tours, the Dellinger block. It looks like one building, right? It's three buildings. It is three buildings. This is the, the half down here on the first floor was built as a one-story building, 113 North Main Street, a one-story building over here, 117 North Main Street. This, both of these are older than 1884. We don't know how much older. They're on the 1884 map, um, and that's as much as we really know. So it, it would be unreasonable to think that they got back into uh, much be before the very late 1870s. Um, because we weren't building brick buildings until uh, about after 1879. That's when the first city ordinance, the brick ordinance, went into effect. And that's why we have so much brick. But everything else tended to burn down. So both of these first floor sections here are older than 1884, and they are separate, or they were separate. The top floor was put on top of both of them in 1891, and it had its own stairway that came right down here to the front. So three different addresses, 113, 115, 117. No inside interconnections to the upstairs either. So what about the vaulted sidewalk space? Well, you're going to have to take my word pictures for, for, to believe this. We now have a new stair that can go down into the basement there. And on this side, the 113 side, you can see the inner wall of the vaulted sidewalk space. They're all filled in with metal and all this now, so I don't really know what's over there. I'm told that it's been filled in, as many of the spaces have been. But what we have is a nice big door filled with metal and two things that look for all the world like windows. So this is another one of these categories where it kind of looks a lot like it would have been a storefront because it's got a door and windows. If it were just the access to the under the sidewalk vault to make the basement bigger, you'd think it would just be a simple door. Why would you have windows into your, your storage room? I don't know what they were thinking when they built things, so I don't know if that logic applies, but that's the way it is now. Now, what's under this one over here, which we think is probably the older one, this is one of the very few sidewalks in the Uptown Business District that most absolutely definitely is not vaulted. You know what's under there? What's under there is solid granite bedrock. When you go inside and get into the basement of the two, and they have interconnections, doors in between them, you come back up to the front end on this side here, and about uh, 20 to 30 feet back under the building, you come up to a granite outcrop. The basement is not nearly as large as the basement is under 113. So you come up to that granite bedrock outcrop in the basement, and that's it. And it continues out under the, the sidewalk and actually out under the street, too. 
because the last time they tore up this part of the street, it was quite obvious that it's granite bedrock only a few feet down. And if by a few, I mean single digits, three or four feet at the most. So um, that's one reason we are quite sure that this one is the older one, because by 1884 or whatever, they were really pushing things and making them as big as they could. So, so no vault at all under there. Not possible to go from up the street at Curley's or anywhere else down the block this way. It is a solid granite block down there, and it is the bedrock. And here's inside the basement uh, of 113. Uh, on the other side of that wall there, right here, is where that granite bedrock is in the next part over. I couldn't get a good picture of it. Couldn't get that good of a picture here. So right behind me is we're looking, we're looking to the west here, um, and that's where the original stairs were, uh, is, is where the, the wall of the vault is with the door and two things that look for all the world like windows. Uh, now this one we talked about, the Herbert Tower. Here's the stairs that go down into the barber shop that was underneath, the storefront, clearly a, a storefront underneath there. Uh, it started as the Salvation Army and became a delivery service, a courier company, and the barber shop was there from 1928 until 1969. And so this again is the kind of, uh, of detail, the glass work and so on, a nice doorway that you would expect if you're talking about public access to a retail store. This, you're going to do it as nice as you can, just like we do on the first, the ground level, right? So this is sort of comparable to um, the one by the Prigby's, I think, except theirs is even nicer. Now here's in the speakeasy. The column right there is the edge of the building. So that space back there along the wall is under the sidewalk. If you've been on that tour, you, you, if you've been with me, you hear me dramatically telling you about that. And there are skylights there that would have let the, the light down through the glass uh, bricks into that part of the vaulted sidewalk. And there is absolutely no interconnection to anything else. It's just the basement. It makes the basement bigger. And unless you're paying attention, you wouldn't know that it was anything but the basement. City Hall, another stop on the tour. And we're going to jail underground here. I don't want to give away too many surprises and secrets, but the vault that's under the sidewalk here has a stairway that goes up to the first floor from that vault, and it's exactly the width of the City Hall. And there's all kinds of furniture and stuff in there. It was undoubtedly the city records vault. There are two big safes. There are uh, big, big bookcases that have rollers on them. We interpret that to mean that those were for like 50 pound ledgers to get a ledger in and out of that, that bookcase. So that's what's under the sidewalk right here. And, um, uh, and absolutely limited exactly to the width of the city hall. You would not expect a, uh, a, a city records vault with, with, with safes and records and documents to connect along the block this way. Who knows what was on this corner, the vacant lot right there? Brewery. It was. It was the California Brewery and the California Saloon. So, no, there's no secret connection, trust me, between the City Hall and the California Saloon. All you have to do is go outside and go up there. <laughs> this is on West Broadway now, the, the Mantle and Bielenberg block where, where uh, uh, Sarah Rowe has her store today. This is, I believe, the only other obvious one that's still visible on the surface besides the Herber Barber Shop. That, uh, that had a public access to an under the sidewalk storefront. Here's the stairs that go down, um, and uh, here's the storefront. It's kind of like the barber shop in terms of quality. It's you know got some windows and doors, and it's wood. It's not got that great cast iron like the, like the one at the Priggies do. And here's what it looks like on the surface. Here's their front door. This is the big archway of the M&B block, and there's that space right there. So it's really quite obvious. And you can always argue, well, even though it looks like it was a retail storefront, maybe it was really just the basement. I don't think you can make that case if you felt like it. And probably there are others where you can see a, side, a stairway that goes down into the sidewalk, and it's not fancy, it's not anything special, and it's almost certainly exactly that, private delivery entrance for the, for the under the sidewalk space. This one, I'm not willing to say one way or the other. It looks pretty nice, and, and, and it has an external appeal and a visibility that would make you think it's a retail storefront. And this is uh, another one that we can find around uptown. This is on Hamilton Street, just around the corner from Granite. This is Lisa Wareham's uh, studio, her early studio. She now has the whole building. So a stair that went down into uh, a doorway down there, and sort of a, a daylight side, a day daylight basement type of a situation here. This is almost certainly 119 and a half uh, Hamilton Street. And that's where Dirty the Babyseller lived. 
from uh, the late 1930s into the 1940s. She had her office and her interesting operation next door in the building above uh, Julian's today. But this is where she lived. She lived in a lot of places. You get the impression she might have been on the run a little bit. <laughs> but uh, and if you don't know the story of Gertie the baby seller, Google it, you'll find out. There's an entire uh, website called Gertie'sBabies.com where people who were sold into adoption by Gertie are, are out there trying to find their birth parents. So there's at least 38, I think, is the count of people that know they are Gertie's babies that were sold, bought by her and then sold into adoption. And this went on into the 1950s. So this is where she lived, at least from about 1934 to something like 1943, something like that. Take slides. You know about these, right? Um, this is the one in front of the M&M. There's one in front of Walker's over by the Meadows. There's one on Galena Street. These are absolutely the symbols of saloons. Uh, underneath this door, the one at the, at the uh, M&M for sure, there is a sloping thing. It's got rails on it, and it goes down, and it has a little humpy thing on the end of it. The guys on the top would roll the keg down there. The humpy thing slows it down. Somebody picks it up, puts it in the cooler. As, uh, those are keg slides, and, and that's what these metal doors uh, symbolize in the sidewalk. This is right in the middle of the sidewalk. So again, you know what's underneath the sidewalk in that location. Three, there's only three of these that I'm very aware of. There might be some others. I, I truly don't know everything. <laughs> and the glass bricks you know about, too. These are have vanished a lot. And these ones right here are in front of the Leggett Hotel. There are two panels like this. These are absolutely the best ones that survived. Um, there were some in front of the, the Priggy office building, and Leo asked to, to be able to keep those. I, I haven't looked since. They, they were just putting the concrete in last Saturday over there, and I don't think, I can't imagine that they put them back in. But I think, I hope he got them at least, so that that could be used for, for information and, and historical display. There are a few others around town, but very, very few at this point. But these had to be virtually everywhere around you in the sidewalks, everywhere. Oh, what were they for? Great. I'm sorry I didn't point that out. They're to bring light down into the vault. Light comes down through these glass bricks. Most of, the, most of them had facets on the bottom, so it actually focused the light, kind of like a, not a magnifying glass exactly, but, but, but it, it did uh, disperse the light more. So it wasn't just like coming straight through plain glass. They were, they were designed to focus light down into the, under the sidewalk wall. So in the speakeasy, where we had skylights there that had stained glass in them, the light would have come down and illuminated that stained glass. So really quite elegant. Um, in, in other cases, it was just a way to get ambient light down. By the 19... By the 19... By, by 1900, I can't imagine that any place uptown that was being built wasn't being built with electricity. So it would have been just an extra benefit. Maybe it's a separate room if, if, I don't know, and I've never been in the basement of the Leggett, but maybe there is a wall there, and maybe they didn't electrify the wall out there, didn't put a light out, who knows. So, but that's what it's for, is to get light down into the wall. Is there any structural reinforcement on those glass? There's an excellent question, and um, I knew somebody was going to ask that. Thank, thanks for asking. I honestly don't know how, how the original sidewalks work. There had to be some kind of support. Yeah. But they do tend to collapse, you know, so the support isn't great. That's why we're doing all this work to fill the spaces in and, and build these incredible complicated metal infrastructures to support the new sidewalks. That's what they did down there. They put rebar in there and on a wooden frame and all this complicated stuff. They're not cheap. So the answer, I think, is not much. <laughs> so no walk on them. Well, <laughs> lasted, this one's lasted since 1914. I think it's fine, unless you start seeing cracks. Then I, I, I walk on them all the time. <laughs> okay, Chinese tunnels. I, I am here to debunk the myth of Chinese tunnels. There's no such thing as Chinese tunnels. People who are way, way, way better than I, Priscilla Riggers from the University of Idaho, um, um, Ellen Baumler at uh, the Montana Historical Society, they've studied these things in cities all over the West. There is no such thing as Chinese tunnels. Now, having said that, they had everything else that we had. They may have had steam tunnels. They may have had access to that culvert that came down past, the, past uh, Colorado Street over here. And they most assuredly did have sidewalk vaults. 
Here at the survivors, we can show you how that worked. Um, there are four here, one right there with the rails around it, two essentially daylight basements right there. The Wachong Tai building here is 1899, the Mei Wah is 1909. I bet none of you have been in the basement there. Have anybody been in the basement there? Okay, yeah, Harriet has, of course. <laughs> but uh, so this will be a novel for you, perhaps. Here is on the Wachong Tai side. This is looking at the wall of the vault. So that space in there is underneath the sidewalk. Now, if we go in there and look to the left, <coughs> this is what you see. And it's hard to tell, but that's a stairwell, a stairway right there, a wooden stair that came down toward the building, from, from the street toward the building, which is unusual. Most of them went parallel to the building instead of perpendicular to the building. This one clearly goes down uh, uh, perpendicular to the building. So this is the nature of that space there. Have another one. No, let me go back. And how old are these? Um, this column right here, it's not really a column, it's just uh, uh, the wall and it's got boards attached to it. You see all that scruffy looking stuff there? Those are newspapers. <laughs> and they are from 1898. <laughs> now I just told you the building was built in 1899. <laughs> so either they were getting old newspapers or these boards that for whatever reason had the, the newspaper stuck to them were hauled in from someplace else at least a year later. We have these on the cases that are on display up there in the Wachong Time Mercantile as well. They have 1897 newspapers on the ends of them. I think it's not clear why on the cases, if that was sort of insulation to keep the bugs out or something, it's not totally obvious why they're there. But they are there and they're from that, that same era, 1897-98. So I think that we can conclude, I'm, I'm using that as, as one step toward the conclusion that the vaults are about the age of the building, okay? So it's not like these were put in years later and therefore we did away with the interconnections. Now I'm saying that the vaults are the age of the building, probably, that's a stretch and a conclusion, but, uh, um, but about the, the age of the building. This is on the Maywa side, on the inside, and the Maywa, the Maywa is really kind of two buildings as well. Uh, and, and in the basement, it's quite obvious, there are basically two separate basements under there. And, and that's evident back here. You see, we're looking at that one and that one now in, in these pictures here. So two doors that went under the sidewalk. These are the inside accesses to the vaulted sidewalk space. And here's what they look like. This stairway comes down parallel to the building, into that space. This is the, the westernmost wall. There's no evidence whatever that you could ever go anywhere beyond the vault that was right in front of the, the Maywa building. No interconnections, just like all the others. This is their private space. Well, here it's private space because those under the, uh, the, the basement spaces, at least in the Maywa, that's where the Chin family lived when they were uh, the occupants and, and people were being born there and grew up there. That would be in the 1920s and 1930s. So this was kind of their, their door to the apartment, if you want to think of it that way. Whereas the upstairs was the door to the businesses, multiple businesses that were up there. Last one I'm going to give you here is an example. This is on East Broadway Street in front of the Grand Hotel. Now today the bakery, the bakery's right here now. Have you all been to the bakery? Oh, you need to go. <laughs> I, I am a champion of the brewery and the bakery, though, so uh, you need to check it out. It's, it's really spectacular. Well, under the sidewalk here in front of the Grand Hotel, until 2011, uh, Butte CPR had their storage down there, and it's quite evident what it was. It was another extension of the basement. Storage, whatever you want to call it. Just stuff. They had stuff. We, CPR had stuff. The hotel had stuff down there. That's what it was not doing. Since 2011, who knows what's under the under the sidewalk here today? The restrooms. The restrooms, exactly. Not the restrooms, just the men's room. Kitchen, yes. Yeah, the, men's, right. the men's restroom for the brewery is what's underneath here. And this little metal guy right here, this is a vent for the restroom. It's a vent for the whole place before. But uh, on cold days, go on, go on a cold day to the to the uh, bakery and, and have something and watch out here and see if you can see the, the air coming out of here. <laughs> no, you can. You can. This is still interconnected down there. So this funky little artifact here on the surface is again evidence of what's going on down in the subsurface, down in the sidewalk. 
think that's all I have to say. Oh, oh, and two other two other tunnels. Yes, I forgot about these. There are a few others. Here's the, the courthouse, the new courthouse, and the uh, the, the old jail. It's the sheriff's department now, just over there. And there was, maybe still is, a tunnel that connected them underground. No surprise there. And the other one that's interesting is just right over here under Port Street. Um, this is was the Murray Hospital in the, the parking lot here to the west of the archives, and across the street was the original Murray Hospital, it's the Bail Bonds building today. When they uh, added the uh, second one, they put a passage underground, because the, the basement level here, see this? Laundry, B-S-T, it's the laundry in the basement for the Murray Hospital, and his nurses lived up above, Dr. Murray's nurses. So this was the connection from the laundry over to the main hospital. So. So you didn't have to cross the street in the winter, I guess, is the main purpose of it. And uh, this continues. We don't have a map between 1916 and 1951, and in 1951 it's labeled not used. And I looked really hard when they were redoing the sidewalk around the bail bonds place over there to see if I could see where it went, and I could not. And again, I didn't try to go down there. So I don't know if it's even physically still present or not down there. Yes? Yes, I used to have a video down there, and it goes for about... You had your studio in here, and so you, you could go under the street a ways. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So it's actually physically still down there. Cool. So, and then the last one I'm going to mention is one that I swore that I had seen a map of some sort that had it on it, but I couldn't find it. And Cheryl Ackerman knows something about it too. Under Montana Street, from the Stevens Building, uh, where the corner of uh, Park and Montana Street. I think that there was a tunnel that went underneath Montana Street there to whatever was across the street. I can't find the map that I have in my head. Maybe I just heard too many stories and it got stored in my false memory or whatever. But Cheryl has seen things down there that, that may suggest that there was indeed a tunnel that went under Montana Street. That'd be a pretty reasonable place to have a tunnel, um, especially if the two buildings across the way from each other were connected. Very few of those. There cannot be very many of those. These special cases have to be the exception in terms of that, especially because the Sandborn maps pretty well show them. Yeah, yes? Were those for people just to go in the winter underneath? Mine, as far as I can tell, this was just, that was like, the, made it easier for the, and maybe it kept it out of the view of a hospital patron <coughs> or two, to have the, the facilities down yeah. in the basement and keep it all underground. Okay. And <coughs> even in the summer, I would think it would make it a little easier. Yeah. You don't have to haul it upstairs, you just okay. take it across. Yeah. That'd be my guess on this particular one. And on the on the on this one, I'm sure this was for prisoners to take them from, from the jail into the courtroom. Okay, that's all I have. So thank you for listening. <laughs>
ago. Um, at, the, at the corner, actually at the corner we're talking about at Montana and Park Street, where Books and Books is in Bay, there was a Complice. Complice, yes, thank you. Uh, so yeah, the Complice Hall was there, and, and that was a big theater. It, uh, technically, it was only two stories, because it had the theater and then the tenements above it, but I think physically it was probably on the order of four stories tall. And there may have been a couple of others that were four stories, but you know, probably not very many. Yeah. The big steam tunnels that they did the concrete, is there any way to know, are they mostly still in existence, or have they been filled? Or? I have the impression that they are, because those two photos that I, well, depends on how much they exploited the wastewater tunnels, too, that, that big culvert I was describing, that, that was Robert's photo. And then the other one, which was sort of shorter and wider, it was from 2011, when they were redoing the, the, the tunnels down there for, for that. Um, yeah, they seem to be. Um, I'd be willing to bet that Northwestern Energy has an incredibly detailed map that can answer that question. I have a talk to them. <laughs> yes. On that Broadway excavation, I, I can't remember exactly, but it looked like there was an outline of a staircase going into Harrington. Uh, perpendicular. Yeah, perpendicular to the building. Yes, um, that clearly went down into the, the basement. It didn't go into the sidewalk space. It was sort of above it, and, and they have always had a doorway there at the building front, but it was like a half, half basement level. Oh, it didn't go all the way into the vault? It didn't go into the vault at all. Okay. The, the stairway went into the building sort of above the vault, okay. and that's, that's there. I guess it's still there. Yes. They, they, it was there before. I was um, visiting with Leo Prigge, you know, when I was over there looking at the excavation, and he said that they found paperwork in that interesting part of their building uh, that indicated they were selling tickets, I guess it was, was it railroad tickets that would take people on a day's journey down to Melrose to fish. Uh -huh. I could fully believe that because the hotels, the good hotels, they absolutely promoted uh, being access to uh, whether it be the bus line, the trolley line, or the trains, or whatever. So I completely believe yeah. that the Southern Hotel was a pretty prominent hotel in, in oh, its day. Okay. Oh, okay. That's so I completely believe that. Yeah, he might have, you know, he has some of that stuff. It might be interesting for you to just make copies of it. Oh, yeah, you think? So the View Hotel that burned, I don't know what year it was. 1954. Why did they never, and that was next to the Southern Up Village? Uh -huh. They never ever rebuilt it, which was amazing to me because it was still. You know, I guess in 1954, I would presume that the, the, the decline in Butte had been such that uh, they didn't have the financing for it. The Butte Hotel, actually, when it burned in 1954, it, was, it was, had been completely refurbished in the past year before that. And so they had new tenants in like 125 rooms, or maybe it was 125 people were, were put out of homes or whatever. And maybe they just were like, they wasted all that money. I, I don't know what the attitude was. But, Clearly, it wasn't rebuilt. A couple of interesting things. My husband used to work at the interstate window cleaning, and he worked under the bank on the corner of Broadway and Maine. And it was also a like an air raid shelter underneath there. There were containers, big cardboard containers that had survival things, including toilet paper and candy. Yeah, yeah, yeah under there. Mm -hmm. I, I've then, been in places like that, not in you, but I've been in places like that. And then at 119 Hamilton Street, roughly 50 years ago, my husband and his family lived there. Really? Yeah. In the basement? In the basement. Okay. Yeah. And so it's interesting to find out the baby self lived there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have the impression she wasn't really doing baby selling business when she lived there, but she was into the illegal abortion business at that time. Oh, wow. Yeah. Somewhere along the line in the family photos, I know I've seen pictures of that place down there when they lived there. Cool. Very yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.